Welcome to this week in Missouri Politics. Veto session was the big story of the week. Taking a break from the political season, we're now joined by Senator Schatz from Franklin County. Senator, welcome to this week in Missouri Politics. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you. What a big week. Veto session was, I guess, every possible win you could have wanted you got, starting with the gun bill. Explain what. Explain how Missourians have a better Second Amendment protection after this week. Well, there's there's several things. There's multiple components to you know to that particular bill in 656. Obviously, the the big ticket item there was the constitutional carry. Mm -hmm. um, my feelings on that particular issue right there is is that that a piece of clothing, an article of clothing, should not be the difference between being legal and illegal. Uh, we have the ability. Uh, people currently have the ability to to open carry. Uh, and, and so by allowing them to cover that, I think makes people more comfortable. Uh, I had some provisions in 656 that allowed for the concealed carry permit for the extension of the concealed carry permit that gave you an option of a 10 year, a 20 year, and a lifetime permit that would allow you to carry in Missouri, but it would not be reciprocal with other states. And again, we were giving people choices uh, to allow them to make that decision, you know, what type of permit they would want to have. Uh, with constitutional carry and the standing ground provisions, uh, there was a lot of controversy uh, swirling around that. I didn't understand it. I mean, honestly, I think if you look at the, if you look at that law, can you anybody honestly say that one more person is going to get shot in Westphalia because of this law? I, I or candidly, one less person is going to get shot in St. Louis. I mean, I don't think the murder rate in St. Clair goes up. Or the murder rate in St. Louis goes down because of this bill, or vice versa. I don't. I don't see that either. Again, I I sat there with some group, uh, a group there, Moms Demand Action, were there at the Capitol. They were obviously protesting mm -hmm. and had a conversation with them. And I simply showed them. I said, you know, here, this is legal. I opened my coat up. I said, this is legal. <laughs> this is illegal. I said, is that what changes the dynamic yeah. there? Uh, currently, an individual can own uh, unless you've had a felony uh, conviction or thing. You can own and carry and possess I a felt firearm. Like they were sincere, though. I felt like they were pro a lot of they, times. You see protesters that come in there, it feels like they're paid to be there, and it's, yeah. it's sort of manufactured outrage. I felt like the mothers that were there were very serious, and, and they, I just, I'm not sure that this is the fight that makes a big difference as far as gun, gun laws go. Well, Missouri. a lot of things that they're concerned about are things that I probably are concerned about it too, yeah. about gun safety, about childhood safety, things of those mm -hmm. natures that had really nothing to do in this particular bill. And so I applaud them for, for standing up and coming as a group, but again, <laughs> Those issues there are something uh, that are they're not included in 656. The people I heard the loudest were the folks that provided the CCW classes. That yeah, they're they're right all, anymore. Said, all of a sudden, a pretty but, big but there, are, there still is going to be a need for those. In order for you to have reciprocation with other states, yeah. you're going to have to have taken the training. And I would suggest everyone go through that process. Understand the laws mm -hmm. that apply. Uh, you know, to, to owning a firearm, possessing a firearm, those things, I think everyone should understand that. And I think that's important. And I don't think those classes go away. But again, to have reciprocation with other states, you have to have the training. You have to have every five years, you have to have gone through the background checks in order to go and carry in other states. Big win for Whitney and NRA. Let's talk about another thing you guys did, voter ID. I, I guess I just, I've heard the arguments. I just don't know how you can argue against having to have an ID to vote, especially I, this week there's a special election. Everybody says there's no voter fraud, and there keeps being very high-profile cases of voter fraud. Well, I, I cannot imagine the, you know, why we have gotten to this point where it's been such a big yeah. issue, because everywhere I go, you know, it requires for me to have an ID. Every time I vote in, in Franklin County, I show my ID. I don't carry my voter card or anything like that. So I, I have my ID. And again, we've made it to where people can obviously, we're not trying to make it a burden or hardship on anyone. We just want the integrity of the election process to be maintained to the highest quality we can. And I think that's smart. And again, we do see, we have seen instances of voter fraud throughout. <laughs> if you're uh, a young time. looking guy like yourself, you have to show an ID to <laughs> get a, lot, a state guy, lottery yeah, ticket, yeah, but not to get a yeah. state ballot. It, I, I think that um, there, there may be a case where a few folks will have to forget theirs and come back. But a lot of times I hear older folks don't have IDs. My grandparents had IDs, right? I mean, I, I, I think you're getting to the point in society where the government demands IDs for so many things. Voting seems pretty elementary. The, the question that was asked in the galleries as you guys were passing this bill is, what judge will find some provision to strike down the will of the people this time? I, you know, unfortunately, I can't answer that, but they may try. Uh, there sure. may be some activist judge out there that, that does that. I would, again, when, and so what will we have to do next in order to continue <laughs> to push this forward? But again, yeah. I have agreed with this. You know, I've been in the legislature for six years, and we've been talking about 
about voter ID for a long time, and I think it's about time we got this done. And again, once this is in place, it should be it should be in place everywhere across the United States, as far as I'm concerned. Talk about a bill that you uh, took through the legislature and over to the governor on the ag disaster bill. Yes, Tell us about uh, it. you know ag disaster. Obviously, uh, the the ag disaster, the the USD payments that come in when there is a declared disaster have been taxed as, as state income. Uh, we felt like uh, it was time that we again. There's no other ag disaster payments or any other disaster payments that are taxed as income and so uh, we are exempting them from from state income tax obviously the governor is strongly and vehemently had disagreed with this he had overstated I believe the actual the, the potential cost to the state is it is retroactive it goes back it allows people to go back because there was a, a you know some disaster payments have been made mm -hmm. and they could amend their tax returns and go back and and, and receive some uh, relief from that but uh, again it's uh, these things are very very rare in occurrence and no, uh, it's about fairness. There's no other disaster payment that's treated in this way. This is not crop insurance. It's not anything like that. But the reality is, you know, agriculture is the number one industry here in our state. And if we really can, that gets overlooked sometimes. I, I think it does. I yeah. mean, it, the reality is, it, I mean, that is the driving force in our economy is agriculture in this state. And when you look at the, and again, this was kind of, you know, looked more towards the uh, livestock industry and the ability for them to make to maintain those herds. Cattle you cannot, were more than the capital and force. Oh, I mean, there was a lot of they, a lot of they were there the last group to leave was yes. the cattlemen. You could tell them by the hats, but well, I was they were I was in the house. After we had passed that, I was in the house, and obviously we needed <clears> some <throat> help over there, and, and so I was there waiting when they brought the disaster bill up, and, and yep. they were out there, uh, you know, till Makes till a the difference, end. doesn't it? Oh, it, it does. Seeing people mean, that really care. And, they, and again, because again, those people, I represent Franklin County and Western St. Louis County, and I have a large contingency of, of cattlemen in Franklin yep. County and also in Western St. Louis County. People may not understand Huge or believe that. Huge Farm Bureau presence in Franklin County. Yeah. Absolutely, and so uh, it's important. And, and again, it's important to them. It's not. It's not, it's not a tremendous amount uh, of money, but obviously, it's some relief that in, in difficult times, when higher than normal food hay costs and, and water issues could be uh, there, this is when these disaster payments come in and are being helpful. So we were glad to get that done as well. Let's talk politics. Uh, biggest race in the state's the governor's race. Absolutely. You have a conservative running, and you have a Republican running. Which one are you backing? Well, obviously, uh, I would like to serve uh, with a Republican. Uh, you know, in my time in the legislature, and hopefully uh, this time around, it would be nice to see get that done. There are some things that are that have been prohibited from being accomplished in my time in the legislature, and unless we have a Republican governor, we may not get to those. Well, that's uh, that's an interesting point. Um, the the Republican has been attacking Republicans lately. Yeah. Your staff, if you if they work late, like they did Wednesday night, sometimes we'll eat some of the food that the Senate administrator provides for folks to eat if they work till what was it nine o'clock, ten o'clock. Uh, Wednesday evening, uh, that you were called a corrupt crony for that by not the conservative in the race, but by the Republican. Well, and I would disagree with that. Again, I, I don't think yeah. that uh, there were some statements there. Does it make it uncomfortable sometimes when, you know, we could probably play a game where I would ask you who said it, the Kansas City Star, the Post Dispatch, or Eric Greitens, and it might be very hard to know which one was which. Yeah. I, and again, I think that part of that it was maybe politics running up to, uh, you know, in in the Republican primary. Again, I disagreed with some of those. Well, this statements. was after the primary, and it, even then, I'm and I'm going to continue to disagree with some of those statements. But but I do, at the end of the day, I do believe that uh, Eric Greitens. I it would if I have my choice, I'd rather have Eric Greitens sitting in the governor's mansion uh, for the next four years as opposed to to Chris Coster. Uh, well, there's I mean, another <clears throat> the latest issue he's made in the campaign was the renovations that were done to the the Supreme Court building. I think couches for Coster is what it's called, but you were in the legislature in 2013. You voted for HB 13, the Capital Improvements Bill. I don't think you're corrupt. I don't think Senator Lamping was corrupt. That also voted for it. That no, supports Eric Greitens. Do you think there's a conversation folks like you and Ron Richard, Mike Kehoe, Todd Richard can have after the election that says, look, okay, the, it, now it's time to be serious? Oh, I absolutely. Again, I think that by and large, you know, when I, the people that I've served with, you know, there's not corrupt people in Jefferson I agree, City. 100%, I'm yeah. telling you what, there's people there that have the right motivation. The, the Democrats right aren't corrupt either. No, there are people there. They're yeah. all up there, passionate about what they do, and I don't see the corruption that people claim. They want to. They want to. That, that's a buzzword. Sounds good, but that just doesn't really exist in Jefferson City. Uh, and so I, I don't really uh, buy into that. Well, Senator Shots, the most interesting governor's race we've I've ever seen. Leads most into interesting it. election probably in my lifetime. I think that's a fair level statement. And state level, people so. always say that this time it's true. And I think it leads in the most interesting session and you're one of the serious policymakers. We'll hope you'll be back to talk about all of it on this week in Missouri Politics. I would do that. Thank you very much Thank for you, being Scott. on. We appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be right back with our Opinion Maker panel. Danny Pfeiffer's back on the show, but we'll leave you with this, this week's leading Missouri economic indicators.
For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople, while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. For years, Jason Kander has been trying to create a liberal majority. We're going to call you pinkos, commies, lefties, activists, liberals, and tree huggers. If you stay true to your values, they're going to have to call you the majority. Kander values expand Obamacare, higher job-killing taxes, even a huge new energy tax, more Washington policy mandates. They're going to call you pinkos, commies, lefties, activists, liberals, and tree huggers. Jason Kander, wrong for the U.S. Senate, wrong for Missouri. I'm Roy Blunt, and I approve this message. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. Welcome back to this week in Missouri Politics. We're going to jump right into the Opinion Maker panel. First time on the show, Sam Gladney, attorney here in St. Louis. Very glad to have you on. Thanks for having me. Angela Bingaman, Public ISTL, all things St. Louis. Glad to have you on. Thank you. And joined us down in Jeff City for veto session. Yes, I did. She got a full up close look at it. <laughs> so she got to look at Danny Pfeiffer, uh, <laughs> head of Catalyst, that. Super Jeff City lobbyist. Glad to have you back, sir. Good to be here. Eddie Justice, the chairman of the 8th District Republicans. I guess anything south of Jeff County, I think that if it's a Rep two Republicans together, Eddie Justice is in charge of it. Glad to have you on this week in Missouri Politics. It's good to be here, and I appreciate you giving me the credit for stuff that I may not have done. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about something you you have done. You've helped elect a lot of Republicans, and they had a big day this week at veto session. Let's start with the gun bill. Huge win for the NRA, huge win for the House Speaker Todd Richardson, a friend of yours. Huge win for House Republicans that you help elect. Well, uh, politically speaking, that's a monster issue and, and in southeast Missouri especially uh, we've gotten to the point in the 8th district now where we don't have any Democrats in the House and we don't have any Democrats in the Senate and uh, we want to keep it that way and the way we do that is we find issues that are that mean a lot to the people and voters of southeast Missouri and this is an issue that people care about where we're down in our neck of the woods. Danny Viper, I, I saw, I noticed something, a, dem, a former Democrat senator pointed out to me, there's no pro-life Democrats, no pro-gun Democrats, and there's no Democrats outside of Jackson County, St. Louis County, and St. Louis City. Yeah, I think that's a great point. In fact, that's what I was going to mention is that, you know, this, as much as this has become a partisan issue, it's also become an issue of geography. Yeah. If you look at it, it really, it, it's an urban, rural issue. If you look how the votes break down, and I think of how people feel about this, and there are some unique issues, I think, that play into that crime, incre you know, increasing crime in the city, increasing gun violence in the city. That has created this issue. That has helped create this issue beyond politics and beyond your philosophical belief about guns. Big week for the NRA, though. Big week I mean, for the NRA. Wit deserves a, this is, is a big week. Angela, you got to see it up close. I mean, I, I heard one person describe this as a tough vote. I didn't see this as a tough vote for anybody that voted for it. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I think those who were for it definitely went ahead and and voted to override the governor's veto. Um, I think those who are against it. Um, you know, try to stand their ground, if you like that pun, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> couldn't get anywhere. And it's unfortunate for the minority, I believe, that feel very strongly against this, that they couldn't make any, um, any movement. So Let me ask you this, though. Do you really believe that there'll be one more person shot in St. Clair, Missouri because of this, or one less person shot in the city of St. Louis? Um, you know what? I think that the, it's... Maybe not the issue of who's getting shot, but, you know, overall uh, gun safety. I think that uh, if you take the issue and, and look at it as, you know, right now it, it takes away, um, you know, the background check. It takes away the, the training. Um, I think that guns, you know, they, they can kill people. Um, it's the same thing as you get in a car and you, if you don't know how to drive it, you could kill someone. And we require someone to take a test before they can uh, get behind the wheel. So it's more about 
about safety, and uh, I don't know if someone in St. Clair County who's never held a gun before goes and picks one up and accidentally shoots himself. You know, it's it's one of those issues that I think that if you're going to put something that could take away a life in someone's hands, you want to make sure that that they know how to use it. So that's where I have the issue. Um, but uh, for the Second Amendment, I, I do understand. You know, we want to to make sure that uh, the Second Amendment is protected on the Republican side, but it kind of goes into you know personal safety and and is this something we really want? Sam Gladney, uh, you're a veteran yourself. You've shot bigger guns than I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> when you really look at this, does having a constitutional carry as opposed to a concealed carry? I mean, the people that are going through the pro trouble of getting a concealed carry license and they can get one, they seem like the folks that are probably, because they get to wear a pistol on their, you know, with their jacket over it, does this really matter in the grand scheme of crime or gun safety or? No, I don't think it does. And frankly, I wish that our state legislature would spend their time fixing our schools, uh, fixing our roads, doing things that actually help bring jobs to the state. I don't think this gun issue, you know, if you, have the right to have a gun, you should be able to carry it. That makes sense to me. I don't think it makes that big of a deal um, as, as far as the crime aspect is concerned. Yeah, we certainly need to work on crime in our cities and all across our state, but I don't think that whether or not you have a permit is gonna, is gonna make that big of a determination. I wish they would spend their time you know, on other matters that are gonna bring jobs to the state and help people put food on the table for their family. For the Democrat Party, though, I mean, to win some of these state legislative races in Jefferson County, Clay County, the Boot Heel, places Democrats have normally represented, I don't think guns are up for debate. The issue's been settled there, and they're mm -hmm. pro-gun, right? They are, they are pro-gun, and you know, they're pro-gun, but they're also pro their children having a decent school. Mm -hmm. They're also pro having a job. I think when Democrats focus on those issues, that's when they win as opposed to, you know, trying to focus on some of these other things. So I don't, like, kind of like you said, I don't think that long term it makes that big of a difference yeah. as far as safety is concerned. So my biggest issue is why are they even talking about this, the state legislature? They should be talking about things that get people jobs and help put food on the table. Well, then, but let's talk about a process thing that actually has been running home here in St. Louis, uh, voter ID. Yeah. I know the, the situation in, in Representative Hubbard's district isn't exactly voter ID, but you, I think it's hard for Democrats to continue saying there's nothing to see here with right. voting issues when there's constantly voting issues. There's no doubt that there <clears throat> are instances of voter fraud and there are instances where there are issues with the election process. Mm -hmm. At, at the local level. There's no doubt about that. I don't think it can be disputed, and I think to try to dispute that is really, it, it's sort of silly in a way. Um, but but there, there has been, as you know, a great debate. I mean, the two biggest issues of the veto session this, this, this past Wednesday were constitutional rights, guns and, 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 the, and the right to vote. And what, what, the, what the legislature did in uh, overriding the veto on, on voter ID was allow the voters to vote this, this November and make a determination whether they want this to be codified in law or not. And so we'll see what the voters say, but it's pretty clear, I think, where the legislature's come down on it. Any judges, I mean, I think the question in the gallery was what judge is going to find a reason to reject the will of the people this time on voter ID? Well, there's always one that's willing to step out there and <laughs> find like a there reason. Always is, yeah. And uh, it's just a matter of where they, how important it is to them and what, what side of the aisle that they want to commit themselves to. But, um, you know, it, it, to me, it's a very logical issue to go after the, the uh, photo ID just because of what you said. You know, we, get, we see case after case after case of where there's fraud, and yet people get up in the chambers and say there is no fraud. Well, it's illogical to say there is no fraud. We have six million people in this state. Somebody's going to try to change the result of an election based on their actions. So it, we get it done, get it over with, move on down the line and get to some of those issues that Mr. Gladney was talking about. Angela, won't it be easier for them? I think to explain this to a person watching this show today, they have an ID, they show it to get on a plane, they show it to get in a bar, they show it to get a state-issued lottery ticket sometimes. <laughs> I think at some point it's better for Democrats to not have to argue this issue that I think is a, is a pretty big push to just regular Missourians who have an ID. Yeah, and I, I think that the idea of a voter ID is going to um, make some, you know, very upset and think that, you know, a large group of voters is going to be disenfranchised because of it. But if you look at the language of the bill that was finally passed, I think that the Senate Democrats did a very good job of making it. They watered it down. A lot. They, they that watered is, that it is down one thing that has been talked about. Very, really very yeah. much. So the the first bill 
um, that was set uh, to the to the Senate, I think that uh, there was a lot of objections from the Senate Democrats. But if you look how it went through the process, I think what came out of the process is something that, you know, as I can begrudgingly say, okay, I'm okay with this. Um, but the issue at large, I think it's more of a, you know, a philosophical issue. Um, and I think the Senate Democrats in the, the House, they, they tried to, uh, you know, sustain the veto. But at the same time, I think they knew going in that there, that, that wasn't going to happen. So I'm glad you just last point on this. Is it not better if this issue's off the table? I just think it's hard to explain to a regular person in Jefferson County that you don't have to have an ID to vote. I think one of, one of the problems with voter ID is it disproportionately impacts a lot of the most vulnerable people in our society, a lot of the elderly, a lot of the poorer people. How are they able to exercise their right to vote? You know, I think it would be great to get it off the table if we also had early voting. If people had two weeks and were able to vote in Missouri sure. as opposed to having to take off work on Tuesday and figure out how they're going to get their kids taken care of, you gave somebody two weeks, you know, they could go the first day. If they didn't have an ID, they could come back later. The, those are sorts of compromises I think could work. But, you know, right now, just having it only on a Tuesday makes it hard for people. And I think we should be making it easier and fairer for people to vote. Not I think some of the one of the things is not talked about. Let's pivot to the governor's race. If you make it harder and make it more controversial and somewhat dangerous to vote absentee in St. Louis City, you're hurting statewide Democrats. But let's pivot to uh, let's pivot to the governor's race right now. Missouri Times did a poll this week in our in our weekly tracking it shows Chris Coster increased his lead to 49, I'm sorry, 49, 41 or so, uh, right knocking on the door 50, up eight points. Uh, do you believe that's where this race is right now? I think it is, and I think part of the reason, you know, I'm an Army veteran, a West Point guy myself. You're head of the Veterans for Coster, right? I am, and, and one of the reasons that I like Chris Coster is because he's a solutions guy. You know, I had an Army boss once tell me, don't be a problem identifier, be a problem solver. If you're a leader, your job is to come forward with solutions to problems. That's what Chris Coster has done on everything from uh, the opioid issue uh, to increasing, um, you know, how we can get jobs for people, making college more affordable. He's a solutions guy. And as a veteran, I kind of like that. I like the fact that someone who wants to lead my state uh, knows how to do the job. And I think he's showing that to a lot of people in Missouri that he knows how to get things done. And that's why they like him. Angela, being a big week for the NRA, big week for the Missouri Cattle Association, Farm Bureau, those are all groups that support Chris Koster. Do you right. think part of that's why maybe he's bumped up a couple points? Um, I think so. I think Chris Koster has has done a remarkable job of bringing people together in a state where we are so far from each other in in, mm -hmm. in the chambers. And I think his appeal crosses both sides of the aisle. And I think that, um, you know, the poll showing him up eight points over Greitens, where I think Greitens doesn't really know who he is, and that's maybe what we're seeing, um, shows that Koster has, has made his message so clear that he can appeal to that maybe moderate vote that is not represented in, in the chamber. So I'm a big Koster fan. Um, I think that he will win. I think that, uh, you know, he's he's just got to make sure that he maintains the lead going forward. Eddie Justice, you're uh, what I think of Republicans in Southeast Missouri, I think of you. Uh, it's an odd election when you have to ask this, but there's a conservative running and a Republican. Who are you supporting? <laughs> very interesting way to put it. You know, it's very, one of the dynamics that we haven't mentioned yet in this election is the Trump effect and the outsider mm -hmm. versus the insider. And, um, you know, Coster is the insider. There's no way around it. He's been inside politics, whether Republican or Democrat, uh, for a long time. And uh, if people really believe in the outsider and that they want somebody that hasn't been the politics as usual. Where are you at in this race? Well, I'm a Republican. I'm going to vote Republican. But I, I don't I don't fall in the category of the outsider. I like the experience, and I like I like somebody who's um, who's been there and understands the process. But at the same time, when you look at the amount of people that came out and voted for the first time in 20 years for Trump, you have to also look at how that's going to affect the down ticket. So you've helped as treasurer of HRCC elect a lot of these folks that Eric Greitens has called corrupt, lazy embarrassments. Is he castigating your work too? Do you agree with him? He has, I actually think you've done a lot. I think you've elected a lot of great people that have moved the state forward. Do you agree with my view of it or Eric Greitens? Well, I cannot deny that what he said about the legislators in Jeff City has made our job harder. Yeah. I, I mean, there's no way around that. But at the same time, you know, Greitens was at 7% in the first poll in the primary. Mm -hmm and came back and won running away. Danny Fiverr, you've known Chris Coster a long time. Yeah. Uh, I, it looks like some of the endorsement work, it, I think the way that Democrats have won elections for the last three cycles is painting folks as an Obama liberal. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to do that with a guy that's got an NRA endorsement, a Farm Bureau endorsement? The Missouri cattlemen that were in the rotunda of the Capitol, 
you know who they're voting for. Right. Absolutely. I think it is. I mean, th those organizations speak for themselves. I mean, it's the first time, I think, in the history of the state that a Democrat candidate has received the endorsement of all of those organizations. And I think they did it for a reason. He has a, a, a track record of being right on the issues, working hard to protect the interests of the state in those, re in, in those regards. And, in, in, and those groups uh, are, have endorsed him for a reason. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I think if you look at what's happening in this race, it's really interesting. I mean, the momentum certainly is on his side right now. And I think Eric has struggled a little bit to really sort of define, to create a message for himself or define where he wants to take the state. And we've seen, you know, we are 51 days from election day and really not seeing a lot of that yet. Angelina, it's interesting, um, uh, the, the latest attack by Eric Greitens has been uh, something called Couches for Coster. It talked about how the, the, the state remodeled the Supreme Court building, including the AG's offices. I've seen him be pretty critical of a lot of conservatives, even a center-right publication like the Missouri Times. However, used our photograph in, on the website, uh, oddly enough. However, it was a, a bill in 2013 passed by the legislature overwhelmingly by Republicans to help improve the Capitol grounds. Right. Is it another attack on Missouri Republicans? Um, yeah, I, I, I think that he's grasping at straws, to be honest with you. Um, I And like Danny was saying, that he's having a very I, hard time putting his... Senator Schatz is a wild-eyed liberal, <laughs> you know, wasting money. He's, no, he voted for no, this. No, no. And so, like, like I said, Danny was saying that um, that Greitens is having a hard time pulling his message together, so he's trying to kind of cherry-pick things that he think would maybe get a rise or get some attention that are maybe a little bit, uh, you know, sexy that just can... Just politics. Just politics. So, I, you know, I, I agree. I think that it, it, it really doesn't have any substance, and I think that maybe he, he's he's uh, being defensive, and he sees that Coster's kind of going, you know, taking this. So. I'm glad. Do you worry though that Chris Coster's campaign may be too focused on substance in an age where just shooting a howitzer may be more appealing to voters? I think he understands that you have to lead, and that's why I like Chris Coster. I think he understands that you lead both in the way you run your campaign and you lead in the way that that you intend to govern. Um, he's a man of substance, and these problems that we're talking about in the state legislature and in our state, they're not going to be fixed by, you know, blowing something up on a TV screen. They're not going to be fixed by calling people in your own party whatever names he called them. They're going to be fixed by solutions, and he's making that case. He's making it hard to people, and I think he's going to be successful. I, I trust the voters, and I think he does, too. He Eric, trusts them with seriousness. Eddie, just here we are again. 145 House members voted for uh, to renovate the uh, building. Imagine if, if Eric Greitens... I don't know if he's been in the state capitol or not, but if he came there now, it's in all the cranes for <laughs> fixing the steps. I mean, he might call the cops on him himself. Well, it's very interesting what Mr. Gladney said because he, you know, whether there's substance or not in political commercials can often fall flat because a lot of times I think you may be right. voters don't see that. You and I might because we pay attention real close. But when I go out and see the average voter in Butler County, Dunklin County, all across the 8th Congressional District, a lot of those voters don't, un may, well, they may not understand it, but they may not care. Did anybody ever give me, we had 10 seconds yeah. left. The New York Times story, you're starting to see Greitens go to that. I'm surprised he hasn't already. How does Costa respond to that? Uh, you know, I, I think Chris will continue to talk about what he's accomplished and what he's done in the office. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that, I, I don't know that they will necessitate a response necessarily. I kind of agree. I think demonstrating leadership and a vision for the state is critical, and I think that's what Coster's going to focus on. And we're going to continue to talk about this. Uh, TWMP Overtime is going to be at TWMP.TV. Join us after this. We're going to keep going. I'm going to take my tie off. I'm going to let her hair down. And we'll see you next week on This Week in Missouri Politics. This week in Missouri politics, brought to you in part by Sterling Bank.